everybody. This is the Coffee with the Geek program. My name is Andy Wheelock. It is July of 2022. We've come off, I think everyone's come off a big year of, of teaching and a kind of a tiring year. So hopefully today's session will be an inspirational one. With me today is Kristen Magaletti. And I came across Kristen not only through Twitter is what I usually uh, snag my guests from, but I saw her, I'm taking an Adobe creativity class and she is featured on that. And I'll ask her a little bit more about that. Uh, Kristen, just a little bit of her background from what she sent me was she holds a BA in political science with a minor in world religions from BU, Boston University. My sister went there, We family favorite. Uh, mm -hmm. You have an MA from New York University in secondary social studies education also talk about social studies and a dual certification in social studies and exceptional student education. Interesting topic. Uh, so born and raised in New York, full-time teacher since 2007, taught eight years, New York City public school system in the Bronx, and now moved to Florida and uh, off, off camera comment to get away from the snow, <laughs> I think, the, the snow days. Uh, or not, not lack of snow days. Um, but anyway, she, she now teaches social science and social entrepreneurship, uh, interesting courses at a private school in Palm Beach County. And uh, she has extensive training in curriculum design and instruction and has worked with many teachers in professional development throughout her career, which probably brings us to Adobe. So you are at Chris Magaletti on Twitter, and you are an Adobe Education Leader, uh, AEL, an Adobe Master Teacher. And uh, you're also a blog contributor to Go Guardian, which I should have known they had a blog. And um, so we can talk about all of those things. But first of all, first, thank you, Kristen, for joining me today on this summer day. Good to be here. I'm excited to talk to you today. And, uh, I guess we'll start with the easiest question of them all. Do you have, are you a coffee drinker, favorite blend? I think uh, um, coffee is my life blood. <laughs> Essentially, I'm part coffee. <laughs> um, so uh, I, every day, it's usually just a medium roast, uh, but I usually have um, Pike Place uh, Starbucks coffee, um, or even I like the Kirkland Summit Roast, which is their version of it. Um, yeah, even more plug that they're a fair trade brand, um, and I uh, I use hazelnut creamer, so it's a pretty pretty basic coffee, <laughs> but that's what I need every morning. Nice, nice. Uh, okay, so what I usually like to ask, we've talked a little bit about your background, but kind of maybe add some color to your background in education. So, what was your kind of educational journey? You know, you started off political science and world religions, which isn't necessarily an educational uh, start. So. Tell us about why you got into teaching. Yeah, so um, originally I, I was one of those divergent thinkers myself. I really didn't envision myself from a, as being a child and going into education, which a lot of educators do. Um, initially, uh, my, um, my mom uh, works in advertising. Um, one of my inspirations, uh, which is something that uh, you asked as well, um, um, I grew up with that. And so that's what I thought I wanted to do. And I, um, I worked at the Food Network, actually, um, right out of college. Um, and uh, while I was working, uh, my sister, um, who has a learning difference, she has um, a processing and language receptive differences. Um, she was really struggling in her social studies classes. Um, and I was helping her work through and scaffold some of her problems. And I really um, realized that that was something that I was really passionate about. And so I uh, went back to school, um, started working uh, with the New York City um, school system um, in the Bronx. Um, for anybody listening, I was in, um, it was X293. It was Renaissance High School for Musical Theater and Technology, um, which is, uh, uh, it was a new vision school. So um, this vision of approaching curriculum um, with, um, uh, the, the founding leader was thinking about creating a school that uh, kids would learn about uh, English, uh, language arts through drama, through uh, and math through um, tech uh, and, and that space. And really the school morphed into uh, more of a traditional theater school, but um, I taught world history regions there. The kids in New York had to pass those exams as I'm sure you're aware uh, in Buffalo. Um, so I worked there for eight years. Uh, we moved down to um, South Florida. I worked at a small private school and uh, being there 
I uh, was teaching and I was also the director of curriculum instruction. So I worked with teachers, I, I taught five classes. Uh, and then once a week, uh, I, I had teacher workshops where we did observations there and I helped um, administration write uh, observation models that helped give pointed feedback to teachers. Um, and then uh, I moved after a few years to uh, it's a boarding and day school in South Florida, uh, and I'm strictly in the classroom now and I'm, and I'm primarily teaching business classes. So I've really run the gamut of working with students in um, living below poverty level and uh, really needed a lot of support um, to being in a district that, that's really different in South Florida. So and kids are kids everywhere. So the skills that I had um, from working in New York City really helped um, throughout my career. So I watched the Adobe, or I'm, I'm in the middle of the Adobe Creativity course, which you're featured in. And without you know giving away the entire course for free, um, just tell me your ideas on enhancing creativity in students. And let me just add maybe a side note to that question. I think one of the challenges when I think, when I try and bring in creativity to, you know, a lesson is I, I think, and there's, I think some uh, reticence from teachers because they feel like it's going to take up more time to do like a more creative lesson. Talk about maybe the advantages, disadvantages of bringing creativity to class and, and maybe just some of the highlights from the course. Yeah, I, I hear a lot about time. Uh, I hear a lot about uh, rigor. Um, will it, you know, dilute the content and what the kids are able to know? Um, uh, but being a contributor to uh, that project, uh, I'm also a full-time teacher in a high school setting. So um, I'm really aware of, of both of those pressures. And I actually, um, you know, using creativity in the classroom, I think it's especially important because um, if you ask me, this is my 16th year of teaching. If you ask me in my first year, second year of teaching to predict the world that we are teaching in right now and hybrid learning and all this digital space uh, and what kids can do with the internet, I, I wouldn't be able to imagine it. So um, at home, I have two kids, for example, one is nine and the other one is 11. Uh, and my, the two of them right now are creating images in Canva and Adobe Express, and they're putting it on Redbubble and they're trying to learn how to create their own little uh, side business um, from home. So I think that we need to understand that um, what we're teaching for should enable children to have the skill sets they're going to need for a world that we can't predict, right? Communication, critical thinking, collaboration. Uh, to name a few, uh, some of the um, the five C's. Um, uh, so, so number one, I think that that's my why uh, that I really stick with, and I and I think that the issue of time uh, and creativity really comes down to, um, and this sounds something that I think people push back against, but but really deep sense of planning. Um, uh, having taught uh, of all the classes I've taught, probably the, the one that I've taught the most would be world history. Um, uh, and then recently I've taught some uh, AP US history classes. And when I think about, okay, what are the things that they absolutely need to know from a content basis um, helps me kind of plot out what are those content points that they need to know? What is it that I would like them to know? And I'm hoping that we get to but the things that um, I can make a little bit of more space for to enable that creativity. Um, and I think if you think about, you know, learning theory and you think about Bloom's taxonomy, right? New iterations of that talk about the retention of information, the highest point being um, when kids can create and they can apply and, trans and transfer that learning that they have. So um, I find, especially in my AP classes, Sometimes students come in and they really want me to tell them what the answer is, right? Give them a, a slide deck. This is all the information. This is exactly what you're going to need on the test. But I find in those cases, when I teach to that bar of this is what you need and only what you need, and this is what you're going to need to regurgitate, when they're sitting for an assessment or a state exam, they get nervous and they fall short of that bar, um, or they're, they're not able to reach um, kind of the standard that we're looking for. And when you give students the opportunity to um, take what they know, transfer it in a modality that's meaningful to them, that is culturally relevant to them, 
that really enables them to demonstrate what they know in a deep way, um, kids can go above and beyond that bar. Um, and also gives them a sense of self-efficacy uh, and awareness that they can handle um, that content area. So I think sometimes when we look at our assessments and we have a class that we're worried about time, you know, you want to prep them for a state exam or you want to prep them for an a, a push exam and you give them a multiple choice test uh, and they do great or they bomb it, right? I'm really cognizant about what is it that my assessments are telling students about themselves as learners, right? What are those messages that they're receiving? And uh, for example, I was not a great math student. And if I took a test and I got a C minus on that test, um, I really thought, well, that's who I am in math. I'm just not good at math. I can't figure it out. And um, I would kind of self implode. I would just got in this headspace, like I, I can't do it. Like this is where I am as a learner. And I think when you give students a chance to express themselves and demonstrate their thinking uh, in a way that's creative, it enables kids to, to iterate and show what they know in ways that are meaningful that, to them that, that shows them that they can, they can do it and they can push through and, and iterate and, and grow uh, in spaces where they might otherwise be challenged. Um, so it's been my experience in those classes when I'm able to kind of um, give up some of that autonomy and, and give it to students, um, that students are able to present what they're passionate about to each other. We often jigsaw that. And then I give them an opportunity to present that information and we work it back to answer those essential questions so that I'm making sure that they are getting the content that they need while they're able to take those deep dives. Uh, and then I find that when I make the space for that, the kids um, tend to do better on their assessments, especially in social studies where there's writing, because they remember the details deeply about what it is that they researched or that they, that they explored because it was something that aligned with their passions versus, you know, memorize these note cards, take a Quizlet, do a Kahoot, and then you forget it in two months. So um, I've even found that students, when they hear the excitement from other kids as they're presenting, it helps them remember other topics that weren't their own. Um, so it's been my experience uh, and uh, that students, the feedback that I get from them is sometimes they're nervous when they take my class because my class is not traditional in the sense that I'm just the sage on the stage giving them the, all, all this information and they might be used to that. Um, but when students come back to me and tell me that they, they don't even remember how they got this information, but that it was just kind of stored there uh, and it really helped them get through, then I know that uh, it's something that has been successful for them. So that was kind of a, a lot uh, uh, for that answer, but hopefully that's, that's helpful. It's a big topic for sure. Yeah. And I think um, what I kind of hear you saying is, is kind of redefining the education process has benefits in both ways. First of all, it can hit on students' different learning needs or, or perspectives and experience. It needs to be strategic from a teacher standpoint. It can't just be, um, you know, just throw it in there, say, okay, kids, create a movie and I'll, you know, I'll go over here and uh, read the newspaper and you guys just create. It's, it's got to be more strategic than that. Yeah. yeah a, a thousand percent. I am a huge, uh, and I, sometimes geek out about this, um, but I, I really am a firm, uh, my background is in uh, understanding by design and curriculum design and instruction. And I like to imagine that, you know, kids grasp and hold on to every kernel of, of, of information that comes out of my mouth. But the reality is, is that I know that students will forget a majority of what they learn in my classroom. So I really wanna think about what are the essential questions um, that I want to leave students with uh, when, all, when all the small details go away. What are the essential questions? What are the essential skills? And if I keep those at the forefront as guiding my curriculum and instruction, the creative assignments that I give are building on those essential questions to get them where they need to be. I think sometimes you see um, that push for hands-on learning, or, but it's not really minds-on. Right uh, in uh, lower school, um, I uh, was talking with a teacher who um, she wanted to give students a bunch of Legos in the classroom and pictures of different um, famous structures that she wanted the kids 
to build. And the kids loved it. They jumped in, they were, they're really focused. And we had a question about like, well, well, why are you doing that? How does that relate to your content? What is it that you want students to be able to know and to do after they leave that? So the activity in itself wasn't bad, but in asking the teacher to kind of think about those essential questions and why she was doing them, that became more transparent to the kids, which really helped them, uh, you know, focus their learning and of, the, of the why they were doing it as well. And, and I think kids need that. Um, kids need that structure, whether they are in kindergarten or they're uh, in 12th grade to understand what are the objectives uh, and how does this connect to kind of those bigger questions in the classroom. Let me kind of make a, a wider angle. What was it like working for Adobe? Um, Adobe has been, I, I think they're the they're one of the gold standard companies uh, doing educational stuff. What was that process like to create a course for them? Um, they're just a fantastic group of educators who are really passionate about um, transforming learning uh, and amplifying learning for students and teachers. Uh, and what I liked about working with their master teacher project, um, where um, I contributed some lessons to that um, uh, bank of lessons that they created, um, is that um, they're, they're educators. So when we were creating lesson plans, uh, in addition to thinking about, well, how could kids use the tool in a way to express themselves uh, in a creative way, um, we workshopped our lessons. Uh, and I was able to meet with educators all over the world um, who workshopped my essential questions and kind of uh, gave me re resources and ideas to add um, to really boost my lessons. And so I think that in terms of having a PLN, it was awesome because sometimes, sometimes teachers are not given voice at their school, right? And you have all these ideas and you might feel like the square peg in a round hole or maybe, you know, you, you want to kind of share your ideas. And um, sometimes that can be great at your own school, but sometimes that can be divisive. So um, it was really great to be with a group of educators uh, who are like-minded, who are committed to, uh, you know, um, uh, UDL and amplifying learning outcomes uh, and people who really, uh, you know, pumped each other up and supported one another. It was really great. Awesome. So let's talk about what works and what doesn't work. Can you give me a, a concrete example of a success story using creativity to enhance student learning? Yeah. Um, so it's, it's interesting right now because most of my classes that I teach are business classes. So inherently, the kids are coming up with their own concepts. They're creating, you know, business pitches. And so to see kids uh, come back to that space and, um, you know, maybe they weren't the most academic kid, but they're the really charismatic kid, the kid that rolls up their sleeves, to see them flourish and, and see themselves as um, a deep contributor to that space is always something that really motivates me. Um, in a uh, social studies classroom, um, I have a couple of things, uh, a couple of examples that, that I really liked. So um, when I was working in New York, I was trained as an avid teacher. Um, do, you, I'm a, do you have avid in Buffalo? No, so, not that uh, I'm familiar with. Um, uh, avid was a big uh, program in the New York City Public Schools when I was there. And it stands for Advancement via Individual Determination. And essentially, it takes students who um, are, would be the first generation going to college, uh, and it supports them academically with a lot of um, just really great best practices uh, for use in the classroom. Uh, and one of the strategies from them that is one of my favorite um, is called a raft activity. And it is a scaffold that you can apply to so many different content areas. Um, I use it a lot in social studies. R stands for role. A stands for audience, F um, stands for uh, uh, form, and uh, T stands for topic. So, so you can say role, for example. Um, I've done this in a lot of different ways. Uh, I just did it in an economics class where I had students, the role was that they were a financial advisor and they were working for a bank. And they had a, uh, someone who wanted to make an investment and they were a conservative investor. Uh, the audience, uh, um, so that was that was their role. They were a banker. Their audience was the investor. The form, uh, they had to um, create a um, either a presentation, a website, or a flyer 
uh, using Adobe Express uh, or Canva or another you know, tool of choice. Uh, and their topic was cryptocurrency, uh, right? which is really, really volatile. Um, uh, I've also used that same strategy in a social studies classroom where I had you know, different leaders throughout history uh, talking to um, some sort of uh, uh, constituent Right, uh, and they're talking about uh, uh, some divisive topic throughout history, uh, and so that's a really good way um, to when you're looking, for example, for time, instead of teaching about all of these different wars or all these different leaders, giving kids a unit and saying, okay, well, who are the key leaders? What are the key events? Um, who would they be talking to? And let the kids present that information, and then kind of weave it all back together. So. That's one of my favorite activities um, because then you can even, when kids uh, present that information, something that I do in social studies also is um, we do uh, attention meters. So um, attention meter is, one, okay, so, so now the kids have presented this information, they've learned all about what they're trying to you know, explore. And then we'll say on a scale of one to 10 or one to five, to what extent was this event or this person responsible for whatever event in history? Or to what extent uh, was this person responsible for the scandal at this bank or whatever it is that we're looking at? And kids will debate it. I won't, I won't tell them. Well, I think it's a seven or I think it's a two. And, and, and well, why do they think that? And then we go through and we kind of make a graph of like, what did the kids think on average of where this was? And then we'll take that graph that the kids make based on their responses and say, okay, well, let's look at this unit and this information we've put together. If we're gonna make a thesis statement, what were the key turning points in this event? Why do you think that? What's the information that can pull it together? So um, in order to do that, that takes a lot of planning on your part. It looks like, oh, the teacher is sitting back and allowing the kids to put it together, but I'm really orchestrating, what are the things that I want them to see? What are the events that really led to this problem? Right. Um, I want them to see, for example, when I was talking about cryptocurrency, cryptocurrency is volatile. Right. I could tell them that I could show them examples of that or they could figure that out themselves. Right. And then weave this thesis statement together um, using structures that I've taught them earlier in the year to kind of set that up. So um, that's a lot. I know sometimes when I talk to non-social studies teachers, they're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> But I think it's, 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 you know, number one, having a passion for your content area, right? Knowing what is it that, that you want kids to love about your content area? What's that essential content skill that they need? And how do I map that out in a way that lets the kids uncover that for themselves? Uh, uh, and how do I use these tools to amplify those thoughts? That's helpful. Yeah. So, uh, I guess the follow-up question, how did you know they learned? I think um, the way that I know that they learned, A, is um, uh, assessing them like both through formative and summative assessments. So, right, so if I'm asking kids to hand in a report or an essay at the end of it, right, uh, or to take a, a test at the end of a unit, I think sometimes you think, oh, they're learning, this is going great, right, and then they just bomb, they really do awful. Uh, and I think like creativity, you have to scaffold out that information with formative assessments, right? So if I'm teaching to a regents exam and my kids need to take a, a unit exam that models the regents or an AP exam uh, that, and they need to sit for that exam, using those creative, creative demonstrations of learning allows me to hear voice from all students to show that they're understanding the information along the way, right? Uh, if my students, for example, with that tension meter that I was talking about, I would say to my students, you know, sit down, write a complex thesis statement using all this information that you heard in class and post it to a Padlet, right? Post it in our Jamboard on, a, on, a, on an exit ticket. And I can assess what information did each student take in and how did they transfer that information so that I can assess what I need to do for my, my next lesson. Right, and so I think that um, being structuring lessons like that gives more space for those formative assessments versus if I'm talking at them, right? I think sometimes people take compliance and note-taking as, oh, they're learning. 
right? And, and they were so well behaved, but you don't get that feedback until the end of that unit, right? So, so allowing space for kids to make their thinking visible. And, and that doesn't, I know that this is a tech uh, blog, uh, a podcast, but that can be with, you know, traditional, you know, writing on a post-it, writing on your wall, sure. verbally telling you, right? Uh, and that really enables uh, that conversation to happen. And in addition, one of the things that I'm working on with students is uh, their ability to talk to one another, right? Especially kids have been sitting at home for so long and, and hybrid and hiding behind a screen, right? Getting those speaking protocols out and uh, accountable talk procedures and, and getting kids to, to feel comfortable expressing themselves in a way that respects uh, everyone's opinion and diversity of thought in the classroom. Um, that's something that I'm looking for as well and, uh, and giving the kids a chance to uh, make mistakes uh, verbally or, or written. Like that not only serves the point of formative assessment, but it helps build that skill of uh, collaboration and critical thinking as well. So for, for time here, we've, I'm going to combine a kind of two of these questions here because I do want to get to the speed geek questions. Sure. <laughs> um, so from your perspective, um, I think you've highlighted what's working in education. What's not working in education? I mean, again, I'm talking American education. If there was maybe one thing you could say, we really need to change this. I think... Um man, there's a lot of things that are going on in the world right now, and especially in education. But um, I think it's disheartening to hear about the crisis that we're facing in education uh, and all the teachers have gone through in the past year and to hear that standards are being lowered for uh, teacher prep programs in certain states out of desperation. Um, because I think that um, being well-meaning and trying to get more people in front of kids is is great but uh, i worry about um do teachers have enough training to understand the pedagogical choices that teachers make to support all learners right and i think um something that is well-meaning right is um teachers pay teachers for example is this website that's out there and it a lot of people knock it there are some great things that are there um, but you have to know what to look for. You have to know uh, uh, what does a strong lesson plan look like? What does a strong unit look like? Because there's a lot of noise in that space and there are a lot of packets that can be thrown uh, at, at kids. Um, so I think that uh, uh, that's a concern that I have. I also have a, a concern with uh, scripted curriculums, uh, doing something very similar. Uh, scripted curriculums, I think, tends to happen in uh, lower grades, but I, I worry about uh, the lack of teacher autonomy uh, and being able to make choices that best fit the needs of the students that they have in front of them. Um, I've spoken at conferences about creativity before where teachers have come up to me and said, how do I do this at my school? You know, administration won't let me veer from this packet or this structure. Um, and that's a challenge, right? You have to kind of work creatively creatively within the box uh, and the structure that you have. But um, yeah, so I, I do have some concerns. I, I understand the, the written curriculums, especially if you're gonna have people without a background in pedagogy and the, the, the need to feel a sense of control uh, over what you're doing. Mm -hmm. But um, I, that's where my concern lies. And I think that that's where you get a lot of burnout, uh, especially from veteran teachers who see um, kind of the dilution of the profession over time uh, is, is upsetting. Okay, let me throw a couple of speed geek questions at you. Uh, what's your favorite educational blog? Uh, I like Cult of Pedagogy uh, and uh, Edutopia. I think that um, uh, she, uh, for Cult of Pedagogy, yeah, I think she has some just really great, uh, uh, insightful, innovative um, strategies. Uh, linked to lots of different resources that I that I'm always excited to read uh, as well. Yeah, I think she's amazing. Edutopia is up there as well. It's you can't not you can't turn away. <laughs> you have to read. <laughs> yeah, read and it, I I think always for me it helps me like you know spark different ideas of what I can do in my classroom or how that might look of my students. Okay, so I'm going to bring up a wakelet of some of your recent. Uh, this is a new kind of feature here. If some of your recent tweets 
And let's see what you can think about those. Um, you said in one tweet recently, I want to put together a playlist of all these awesome suggestions. I like the concept of wayfinding, quote unquote, or this notion that we are finding our way and learning together with our students. What's up with that? What's wayfinding? Um, I don't know what the playlist was referring to, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, the wayfinding uh, is something that actually um, an administrator said uh, in a session as we were shifting to um, quarantine, when we were first going together, and he was talking to all faculty, especially those who were really nervous to go into this space together. And I just love this expression of that when you're teaching technology or doing something that's outside of your comfort zone, sometimes teachers feel like they want to be the sage on the stage. They want to be the expert and they don't want to be vulnerable with students. And I think it's really powerful to say that we're finding our way together, right? That this, the kids can teach me just as much as I can teach them, especially when it comes to technology. And if I'm comfortable enough to give them that space, um, I'm always blown away with what the kids are able to do, right? Um, there's been um, opportunities where I've, I've given students a chance to, to, to express themselves creatively and I'll, and I'll suggest some tools for them to use. And if a kid comes to me and says, I'd like to use something that's much more advanced, um, I always say, you know, go for it, right? I'll learn with them. We'll find YouTube videos, uh, ways that explain it in ways that uh, make sense to, to both of us. Uh, and and um, I think that that's really something that's that's powerful um, for you as a teacher, for students to hear in your classroom or on collaborative teams. Um, one of my favorite uh, professional events recently was uh, on my AP US history team. Uh, I was working with somebody who had a structure to his lessons and kind of did it in a specific way. Um, and I use HyperDocs in my classroom. And I said, okay, well, you do it this way. I'm going to take how you have your structure. I'm going to, I'm going to add it to HyperDocs. I'm going to add some of these um, creative demonstrations in, uh, and we'll still work together, um, but and I'll keep the pace with you. And over time, I earned his trust. And he said, you know, I want to try that activity. And I got so excited and I added all of these tutorials and things that would help support him in his classroom and kind of duplicate the process for his students. And he came back and he said, you know, that was really transformative for my classroom. So I think the notion of wayfinding and when you give yourself that grace uh, in front of students um, and you let your guard down, it's, it's really transformative. So, all right. And I'll just have one more quick one. Uh, what's your favorite way to unplug from technology? Going outside. Uh, <laughs> for, for real, I, uh, whether I was in New York or I'm here, um, I love to go on hikes uh, uh, by myself with my children. Um, I, my kids play baseball 24 seven down here. And I even find that, um, being in the baseball field, even if I'm really stressed, just being outside for even half an hour, my brain is cleared. Um, uh, and that's, that's been helpful for even uh, going back to campus. Uh, I sometimes at lunch will just walk around my campus, um, to, to clear my head. So, uh, being outside, I also love to, to cook and bake, uh, as well. Oh, so, nice. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, hold on to those those baseball memories. I know uh, it seems like you're always running around baseball here, baseball there, but I, I really miss it. My daughters were both soccer players and my oldest was basketball and golf and I miss it. <laughs> you know, yeah. During the time I was like, gosh, I really wish I could not have some place to go today. But then when it's all over, you're like, gosh, I wish I had some place to go today. So <laughs> what am I doing? Yeah. Enjoy it. Yes, <laughs> enjoy it. Well, uh, Kristen, thank you so much for joining me today and appreciate it and uh, have a great uh, summer and we'll see you. Uh, we'll keep in touch. Thanks, Andrew. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.